right, good morning. I hope everyone is doing well this Friday morning. Um, my name is Rebecca Blackburn Hines and I am with the South Carolina Small Business Development Centers. And we are doing a webinar this morning um, on the Restaurant Revitalization Fund. And we would like to thank our partners with the South Carolina Restaurant and Lodging Association um, for asking us to uh, put together this webinar this morning. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about our organization, um, the South Carolina Small Business Development Centers. We advance the state economic um, development by providing small businesses and entrepreneurs no cost consulting services, one on one consulting services, affordable training programs, and access to an array of valuable resources. Um, the South Carolina Small Business Development Center, we call it the SBDC. We have clients at every stage of the business life cycle from pre-ventures to um, an early stage to established and more mature uh, business models. We um, provide confidential access to um, 50, over 50 professionals throughout the state. We have 20 centers and throughout our state's 46 different counties. Just a little bit about this webinar, it will be recorded. And after we are done today, you will receive an email with this recording and the presentation um, in a PDF form. Um, there will also be some links in that um, information. So you will be able to go back and if you have any questions um, about this presentation because you can't keep up or take notes, um, I totally understand. We'll try to make sure that we uh, we don't move too quickly, but if, if you need to, recap something, we will send that information out to you. And you're also welcome to reach out to us um, and we will be able to provide some individual one-on-one -on -one consulting. You will also receive a short survey and that survey helps us plan for events in the future. So if you don't mind um, taking a few minutes to fill that out, we would appreciate it. Um, this morning on this call. Um, like I said, I'm Rebecca Blackburn Hines. I'm a CARES Act program manager. We have three other presenters. Uh, Tom George is in our, he is the program, or I'm sorry, he's the regional director for the Winthrop region. We have Paul Featheringill, who is the USC region director. And we also have Jim Johnson, our South Carolina state region director. All right, a little bit about what the Restaurant Revitalization Fund is. Um, the RRF became law under the American Rescue Plan Act on March 11th of 2021. This legislation has appropriated $28.6 billion to help restaurants and it has authorized the SBA to award these funds. These appropriations will remain available until expended. Um, I will say that they expect that this fund will go pretty quickly because of the nature of the businesses that it plans to help. And the fund must be used for eligible uses no later than March 11th of 2023. So I am going to turn the presentation over to Mr. Tom George to discuss that who is eligible for this money. Tom? Hey, thanks, Rebecca. I really appreciate that. Again, yes, I'm Tom George. I'm the region director uh, at the Winthrop SBDC. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about eligibility and uh, who is eligible. And uh, those entities that are not uh, permanently closed and whose primary purpose is to serve food and drink. So obviously it includes uh, restaurants, uh, food stands, trucks and carts, caterers, bar saloons, uh, lounges and taverns, uh, coffee shops and ice cream shops that is under the category of snack and non-alcoholic beverage bars. Now we have several categories that uh, there is a provision uh, that you have to show uh, on-site sales uh, that are of 33% uh, of gross receipts that you have uh, on-site sales to the public that compromise 33% of your business. And they include bakeries, uh, uh, brew pubs, tasting rooms, tap rooms, 
breweries and, and or microbreweries, wineries and distilleries, inns. So all those, all those uh, entities will have to provide documentation that your sales constitutes 33% to the public of food and drink. So uh, just so you know that. Uh, also licensed facilities uh, or uh, premise of a, of a beverage alcohol producer where the public may taste, sample or purchase products or other similar places of business in which the public or patrons assemble for the primary purpose of serving food and drink. So uh, I've already had a, a couple of clients that are in like a, a gray area. And uh, I had actually one client that is a kind of bookstore wine tasting uh, venue. And I think that what it, what'll come down to is, is if you can prove that you are selling 33% of your uh, uh, food and drink, any kind of food and drink to the public, that would uh, uh, provide the eligibility for you to get this grant. So how much am I eligible for? It's, it's a pretty significant amount. So the SBA may provide funding for up to $5 million per location, but not to exceed 10 million total for uh, an applicant or any of their affiliated businesses. And there is a minimum threshold. If you weren't impacted uh, at least $1,000, you're in a really good position. If you didn't lose more than $1,000, Let's say between revenue of uh, 2019 to 2020, you're in a good position. So if you don't meet that threshold for $1,000, uh, you are ineligible for this. So how is this program different from any other uh, SBA programs? Well, um, uh, you probably have heard of the uh, Shuttered Venue Operations Grant. In that grant, they are requiring people to register under the System for Award Management. That's the S, it's, it's called SAM.gov, and it's the system where uh, when you're usually seeking grants, you have to register your business. And that also requires, they're also requiring people to register for a Duns and Cage. But for this program, luckily, they're not requiring that. So that is a good thing uh, that we're not having to do that. And it, again, if you're also a non-resident business owner and you have a valid unexpired ITIN, uh, that is acceptable and you are eligible. So if there is ineligible businesses, who, if there is eligible businesses, who is ineligible? And uh, state and local government who are operating a business, they're ineligible. Uh, as of March 13th, if you own 20 or more locations, regardless of these locations, do business under the same or different names or have different industries, you are ineligible. If you're fortunate enough to have gotten a SVOG or Shuttered Venue Operating Operations Grant or you're applying for that grant, you are ineligible. Publicly traded companies, or a company that's permanently closed, a nonprofit organization, they're all ineligible. And finally, again, that threshold, if you're not meeting the thousand dollar threshold that you had lost, or you have expenses that uh, account for a thousand dollars, if you're not meeting that, you're ineligible too. So what type of organizations uh, are eligible for this grant and uh, for lack of a better term, just about everybody. So if you're a C-Corp, S-Corp, partnership, uh, LLC, a limited liability company, sole proprietors, self-employed individuals, independent contractors, tribal businesses, uh, LLCs who are uh, designated as S-Corps, your sole proprietors, and even benefit corporations are all eligible. So if, if you're a franchise, you're eligible too. So any business concern operating as a franchise and meet these requirements, the requirements of, of uh, expenses and things like that, you will be eligible. But there's a, a caveat, you have to have your uh, franchise 
It has to be registered in the SBA franchise directory. And there'll be a, within the application portal, you'll be able to look up to make sure that you are in the franchise directory. If you're unaware of whether you are or not, if you just Google, a quick Google search, you'll find a document that's about 230 pages the SBA has out there that shows all the different uh, franchisors that they have documented. If you're not in there, you're going to have to have your franchise or submit franchise disclosure documents to the SBA, and you're probably going to need to get that done as soon as possible to be eligible for this grant. So are you eligible if you're bankrupt? Well, if you're in either Chapter 11, 12, or 13, and you're under an approved court-approved plan, you will be eligible. You're not eligible if you are permanently closed, you're in liquidation under chapter seven, or you're in 11, 12, 13 bankruptcy and you're not in any kind of approved plan through a court, that means you're ineligible. So we must make a distinction. If you have not started any legal proceedings and closed your business and you're just kind of temporarily closed, you will be eligible for this program. So keep that in mind. So I believe, I just want to make sure if there's that I'm at the end of my, uh, my presentation. And uh, I would like to introduce uh, Paul Featheringill of the USC region. And Paul will be presenting some information on how uh, this grant and this program impacts other relief programs. Take it away, Paul. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. Um, well, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us again. My name is Paul Featheringill, and I am the USC Region Director. Uh, my office is actually in North Charleston, and we have a number of consultants here in the Charleston area that are here to assist you. We also have offices in uh, Columbia, Aiken, Sumter, Newberry, and then down along the coast in Beaufort and Hilton Head. Um, so. One of the questions that we've been getting a lot so far about this new program is, you know, how do other programs, those that have been offered already, impact your eligibility and application for this program? Because as you know, there have been a number of other things out there that, that a lot of people have taken advantage of, including the PPP and the EIDL um, and some other different kinds of relief programs that SBA has offered. So how does this fit into that? Um, well, if you've already received any funding from the PPP, either first draw or second draw, this is it will be deducted from your final funding amount through the restaurant relief fund. Um, and the way they verify that is they look at EIN, I-10, Social Security, or any other number you use to apply for the PPP loan. So any PPP amount you got, first draw, second draw, or both will be deducted from your eligible funding amount. Um, if you did receive a PPP loan based on them needing to verify that eligibility, um, if you did receive a PPP loan, you have to use the same EIN number to apply for this that you used to apply for the PPP. Um, and if you applied for a first draw PPP loan for multiple locations under one EIN, and then after that you applied for a second draw PPP under different EINs, you have to provide uh, the EINs for each entity that received second draw PPP. And so really the purpose for that is that they have to be able to go back and verify what you received in PPP and to make sure that that is deducted from whatever you are are eligible for under this program. However, uh, one of the, the caveats to that is um, if you are applying for this program, the RRF, and you have an application in for a PPP, but you haven't received PPP funding yet, um, you are supposed to withdraw that PPP application so that you can move forward with this. Um, the other part of it is you can't have a pending application or have received a shuttered venue operator grant. If you've applied for that or received that, then you're not eligible for this. And I'll also throw in here, if you're not sure exactly how that all fits together, um, I know there's a lot of questions there about, you know, potentially should I proceed with PPP? Should I proceed with this? Um, 
reach out to us and we'd be happy to sit down and talk with you to kind of help you figure out um, what some of your best courses of action would be. Um, another part of the application is an attestation um, that you have to certify that the current economic uncertainty created by the pandemic makes this funding request necessary to support ongoing or anticipated operations. And we all know that if you have um, been in operation during the pandemic or you opened during the pandemic, that you've been impacted in some way, but they're asking you to actually certify that that impact makes this funding request necessary. And then, um, so next we'll look at, you know, what are some of the things that you can actually use this for? Um, as with the PPP, you can use this for payroll costs, which includes sick leave, um, utility payments for your business, any maintenance expenses you might have. Uh, you can use it for supplies, including any personal protective and cleaning equipment that you need to get, um, food and beverage, expenses, um, covered supplier costs. So these are different things where, you know, they're, they're things that you need to purchase to operate your business from different suppliers. And there's a more detailed list of that or a detailed explanation of that you can find on the SBA's website. And again, we can help you uh, kind of figure out that as well if certain of your costs are eligible. And then other operating expenses, including insurance, marketing expenses, any licensing, legal point of sale equipment, et cetera. Um, so those are all things that can qualify as well. Um, construction expenses. So this is kind of an interesting one. So if you are, you know, a lot of businesses have pivoted their operations or are in the process of doing that because of the pandemic. And part of that is to create more availability of outdoor seating. Um, so if you are looking to construct outdoor seating, uh, you can use funding for that as an eligible expense. However, I've had other people ask me, well, you know, what if I want to open a second location? Can I use funding for that? You cannot. Um, if you are just looking to expand the business, those costs are not eligible. Um, as far as business debt is concerned, that's another area that we've gotten a lot of questions about. Um, you can use it to pay business debt, um, whether it's principal and interest on mortgages um, or uh, business debt itself. So in other words, if you've taken a business loan from a bank or from SBA, anything like that, you can use it for that. However, um, you can use it for that for your ongoing payments of principal and interest, but you can't use it to prepay any debt. So in other words, you can't take the fund and say, okay, um, I'm just going to make the next six months worth of, of payments on my bank loan or on my mortgage. You can't do that. But the ongoing uh, monthly principal and interest payments, you can use the funds for that. Um, now, what's your timeline for using these funds? Um, you essentially the funds can be used for expenses that were incurred or will be incurred uh, between February 15th of 2020 and March 11th of 2023. Um, so you've got a pretty long time period on that potentially to actually use the funds. However, if you permanently close after you receive the funds, that's the end of your covered period. And so you can't use it for anything that comes up after that. And um, uh, so at that point, your covered period ends. Um, and so any funds that you haven't spent by then on eligible expenses, you have to return to the SBA. Um, now, there's another aspect to this, uh, which is that you actually have to provide some documentation to SBA on how these funds are being used. Um, so um, after your, your funding has been exhausted, so after you've spent all of the money, you have to provide a detailed expenditure report and certification for the time period of the expenditure. So basically you have to show them, you have to certify to them exactly how you use the funds. And did you use the funds the way you said you were going to in your initial application. Now, until you do that, because remember, you have a pretty lengthy time period. You have um, essentially two years from receipt of these funds up until 2023 uh, to, to expend the funds. Beginning in December of 2021, you have to provide data to SBA each year through 2023. 
um, or until you expend all of the funds and provide that final report. Um, and if you're not sure exactly what uh, what those reports are going to look like or what documentation they're going to require, that's okay. SBA is not entirely sure yet either. They're going to provide additional guidance on what forms this reporting should take. But just be aware that you're going to have to provide reporting to SBA on how you're using these funds to make sure that you um, uh, that you're using it properly. And one of the things that we suggest, and again, you know, this is something where, you know, one of our counselors would be happy to talk with you about what are the best ways to, to track and report these funds. I mean, for example, one thing we often suggest is that if you get funding like this, you put it in a separate bank account, potentially, um, so you can track what expenses the funds are going to, that you set up some different kind of way to monitor it. But again, that's something that we would be happy to sit down and help you figure out. Um, so, how do you calculate? How do you figure out exactly how much you would be eligible for? So there's three different ways to go about calculating how much funding you might be eligible for, and it's really based on when you opened and when your expenses were incurred. So the first calculation, calculation one, is if you were in business on or before January 1st, 2019. And if you were, then you're going to take your 2019 gross receipts, you're going to subtract your 2020 gross receipts. So that'll show them what the impact on your, your uh, revenue from the pandemic was. And then you're going to subtract any PPP funding that you received. And that'll tell you first round or second round. And that'll tell you how much you're eligible for under that calculation. Now, let's say that you started operation in 2020, but you were only open for part of the year. Well, then how do you figure out how much you're eligible for? Uh, very similar to what they're doing now or have been doing recently with the PPP calculation. So you're going to take your average 2019 monthly gross receipts. You're going to multiply it by 12 and then subtract your 2020 gross receipts and your PPP loan amount. So in other words, let's say that you were open for five months of 2019. And over the course of that five months, you made $20,000. So that means that on average, you made 4,000 a month. So you're gonna take that and you're gonna multiply it out by 12, um, which would give you $48,000 for the year, which tells you what your receipts would have been on average had you opened the whole year. And then you're gonna subtract uh, what you made in 2020 plus any PPP loan amounts. Um, so I know that can be a little complicated, but again, you know, that's something that that as you're you're going through and, and looking at how to calculate that, we'd be happy to help you figure that out. Now, if you began operations um, partially in 2019, you can use either calculation two, which is the one we've been talking about, or calculation three. However, if you use calculation three, that could extend your processing time. So what's calculation three? Well, so and, and you'll see as we're going through this kind of why this extends, this could potentially extend your, your processing time because this looks at you actually documenting um, not just your revenue, if you had any, but also your expenses. Um, so it is intended for businesses that opened um, that began operations between January 1, 2020 and March 10th of this year of 2021. Or if you, even if you haven't yet opened, you could still be eligible for financing if you have incurred eligible business expenses as of March 11th, 2021. Um, so in other words, if you opened at any point during 2020 or 2021, year to date, or if you haven't opened at all, but you have incurred some potentially eligible expenses towards your business, this is a calculation that could work for you to help you determine if you're eligible for any financing. Now, how does it work? So you have to document, you have to show them the amount that you spent on any eligible expenses 
between February 15, 2020 and March 11, 2021. And again, you know, we can work with you. You can look at the uh, SBA website and we can work with you to help you make sure that we're determining what the eligible expenses are. So once you determine what those expenses are, then you deduct any gross receipts you've had in 2020 or 2021. So any money that you've made, and then you're going to deduct any PPP loan amounts that you've made, and that'll tell you how much you're eligible for. So as you can see, for example, if you opened in, um, or let's say you're not open yet, but you have eligible expenses, then if you can document what those eligible expenses are, then you, if you, when you go to deduct your gross receipts, if you don't have any because you're not open yet, then what that would tell you is that you're eligible for funding based on the amount of those gross receipts uh, minus any PPP that you got, which if you're not in operation, you wouldn't have received that most likely either. Um, and as we said, you know, if you started partially in 2019, um, you can use this calculation that's based on expenses, or you can use the uh, calculation too that we talked about based on being open for a part of the year. Um, what makes this one have a little bit longer processing time is the fact that, you know, you're not just showing a number based on your financials or taxes that you're going to provide. You're actually going to have to document specific expenses for them, which they're then going to have to go back and, and verify. So, excuse me. Is there anything that you can exclude from your 2020 gross receipts? Because remember, you know, you have to deduct on that calculation anything that you made in 2020. So um, what can you deduct? Of course, any PPP funding you can deduct because it gets deducted separately. Um, SBA Section 1112 payments. What that is, is if any of you um, received any other business loans through the SBA, whether those were microloans, uh, 504 loans, 7A loans, any kind of financing through SBA, part of the provision of the CARES Act is that they would make a certain number of monthly payments on those loans for you. Um, and it was up to six months uh, based on the most recent legislation. So you can deduct any payments on, on other SBA loans that were made for you. Any idle loans you received, the idle advance, um, or any other grant funds received via the act. Or for example, um, you know, if you received one of the um, uh, one of the state uh, uh, CARES grant awards at the end of the year last year, all of those things you can deduct from your gross receipts. Uh, that falls under any state and local business grants. Uh, Randolph Shepard Act Financial Relief, that is the act that provides for financing for those that are visually impaired to be able to operate um, uh, coin operated vending machines on different federal facilities. So any relief that was related to that can be deducted as well. Um, and I believe at this point, I am going to pass it over to Jim Johnson, uh, the South Carolina State Region uh, Director, who's going to walk you through how to actually do this application. So thank you very much. Um, and if you have any questions, please reach out to any of us who would be happy to help you. Okay, thank you, Paul. Um, so let's go to the fun part. How do you apply? Uh, now that you understand calculations and eligibility requirements. Uh, this is the important, all important uh, section of how do you apply. So you can go to SBA site at uh, restaurants.sba.gov and there's an online por portal there uh, which will guide, guide you through the application process. Uh, that's one of the preferred methods. Uh, or if you have a point of sale vendor, uh, such as Clover, Square, Toast, Spot On, or the NCR Corporation, there may be others on that list, um, but I would uh, definitely check to see if your point of sale vendor uh, is participating in, the, in this program. Uh, you can apply through that vendor and you may uh, perhaps also be able to get technical assistance through that vendor uh, with your application. I would just check into that and see if you can help that way. So if you, are ha if you don't have access to internet or you don't have a POS system, uh, you can always call at the number here, 844-279-8898 and do a telephonic application. Uh, this is probably not the preferred method. Uh, and if you can somehow access the computer, um, that would probably be uh, more efficient, but that option is there. 
Uh, so um, definitely if you need that, take advantage of it. So what documents do you need to apply? As with any funding opportunity, grant or loan, you have to have some documents uh, to back up your claims. Uh, this, in, in this case, uh, is, is, is you have to have that as well. So uh, you'll need uh, on the application, you'll need the SBA form 3172 completed, uh, initialized and signed, and completion of this form digitally on the SBA grant platform will satisfy this requirement. So you can do it through the portal. Uh, verification for tax information, the IRS 4506T, which allows them to access your tax returns um, to, you know, uh, confirm, you know, your claims as far as what you made uh, in sales. Uh, completed and signed by the applicant. Uh, completion of this form uh, digitally on the SBA grant platform will satisfy this requirement. So again, you can do it through the portal. And then gross receipts documentation. Any of the following documents demonstrating gross receipts and if applicable eligible expenses, which would include business tax returns, uh, IRS form 1040 schedule C uh, or schedule F. Both of those are uh, sole proprietor tax returns and schedule F is for a farm. Um, for a partnership, partnerships, uh, the 1065 IRS form, bank statements, externally or internally prepared financial statements, such as income statements or profit and loss statements, and a report from your POS point of sale uh, system, including IRS form 1099K. So what documents do I need in order to apply continued um, for calculation one and two? Uh, as mentioned, you'll need the application form, uh, the tax verification form um, from the IRS 4506T, your gross receipts from 2019, and three months of bank statements. And what is preferred uh, is a 2020 tax return if, if you have filed it yet. Um, and or 2020 gross receipts from your POS uh, partner. And it stresses a validated POS partner because your partner may not be, or your uh, POS um, vendor may not be a validated partner uh, in the SBA. So you, you need to look into that for sure. And accepted uh, would be the 2020 gross receipts just from a point of sale report and any externally or internally prepared financial statements such as income, Statements and profit and loss statements signed and dated certified as to accuracy by the applicant. And then for the calculation three, you're going to need required is the same for calculation one and two, uh, but preferred is going to change a little bit because you need a little slightly different documents. Um, you'll need eligible expenses with a CPA comforter letter. Um, this would be a letter from your uh, accountant CPA, um, basically, uh, you know, signing off or confirming um, your claims uh, that you're sending to the uh, SBA as accurate. Um, then eligible expenses from an externally or internally pre prepared financial statements, such as income statements and profit and loss statements, uh, your 2020 gross receipts, tax returns, and your 2020 gross receipts. Uh, from a validated point of sale report. And also accepted as the 2020 gross receipts from your point of sale just a report and also your external or internally prepared financial statements income. Statements, profit and loss statements and they have to be signed, dated, certified for accuracy. Um, also for applicants that are a uh, brew pub, tasting room, tap room, brewery, winery, distillery, and bakery. Uh, it was mentioned earlier on um, that you have additional proof um, that you would have to provide uh, because based on those type of businesses, uh, you have to show evidence of on-site sales to the public of at least 33% of your gross receipts for 2019. Um, this may include tax and trade bureau forms, state and local forms filed, internally created reports from inventory management, sales reporting, and accounting software. For businesses that opened in 2020, 
the applicant's original business model should have contemplated at least 30% gross receipts in on-site sales to the public. So you need to have, have it, you, you have to be able to prove at least 33%. And uh, for applicants that are in an in, uh, the documents evidencing that on-site sales of food and beverage to the public compromise at least 30% of gross receipts for 2019. And for business open in 2020, the applicant's original business model should have contemplated at least 33% gross receipts in on-site sales of food and beverage to the public. So how do you get help to apply? There's you know, several different um, avenues for that. Uh, one is that you can call the hotline center at uh, 1-844-279-8898. And uh, that will get you to the SBA hotline center for this. Uh, there's also the local SBA district office at this email address. Um, and then there's help uh, available in multiple languages as well. Uh, you can also reach out to the Small Business Development Centers, um, any of our centers uh, around the state. We have 21 locations and uh, be happy to help you and in, in, uh, figure out exactly what it is that you need. So what are some best practices? Um, Jim, can I, Jim, can yeah. I interject real quick with the question that we have in the chat? about the application. Um, the question is that on question number seven on the application, it, refill, it refers to affiliates. Um, does anyone have an answer on what qualifies as an affiliate? And if anyone else on the call has that, we may have to come back to that question. Yeah. Um, we'll, we'll pull it up and come back to it. Yeah, that'll be good. Uh, I don't have the answer to that currently, um, but we can find that for you for sure. <clears throat> so provide complete documentation. So the documents that I referred to earlier uh, that are uh, requested and required, you need to make sure that you have everything. Don't try to do a partial application because uh, applications that are incomplete will be rejected. The review process will restart when complete documentation is provided. So y'all know delays could jeopardize the applicant receiving the award. And I think this is this needs to be stressed. You know, the, the full portal opens on Monday um, and you need to be prepared to get in your application as soon as possible. So make sure you have all these, these documents available and ready to go by Monday. Um, leverage your resources. While not required, the use of CPAs and other accounting professionals may help ensure and complete well-documented applications. Once you submit your application, you cannot make any changes. So you can't go back and re-edit um, if you, you know, forgot to put something in there or made some calculations in error. So um, just try to double check your work and make sure everything's, you know, good and if you have a third party look over it like your CPA and an SBDC consultant, you know, some other folks just taking a look at it, you know, it will really, really help. And then application corrections, SBA is not able to make corrections on behalf of applicants. Applicants who require corrections will need to contact the call center at the hotline number. And then applicants who still intend to apply for the PPP, remember RRF applicants are advised to complete their PPP application in advance of the RRF application. So when can you apply? All right, so there's a pilot period. This pilot period uh, participants will be randomly selected from existing PPP borrowers who self-identified as members of the RRF priority groups, which we'll talk about shortly. Pilot participants will not receive funds until RRF is open to the public at application launch. Priority period, days one through 21. During the initial 21 day priority period, SBA will accept application from all eligible applicants. So if you're not in a priority group, you can still apply on day one. And we highly recommend that. Only applications from small business owners, uh, small businesses owned by women, veterans, and socially and economically disadvantaged applicants will be funded during this uh, one through 21 day period. 
And then on day 22, all eligible applications will be processed and funded until program funds are exhausted. So if you're not in the priority group, um, they'll, it'll be 21 days before your application is processed, but you still need to get your application in as early as possible. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about these priority groups. Um, a small business concern, what is, uh, so the priority group says, a small business concern that is at least 51% owned and the management and daily business operations of the applicant are controlled by one or more of the individuals who are women, veterans, socially and economically disadvantaged. And I'll go back and highlight um, that the business, the manager is owned and the management and daily business operations are controlled by one of these, you know, groups, women, veterans, and socially economically disadvantaged. So this is just not someone has a majority share in the company and doesn't have anything to do with it um, on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, this is someone who is in not working in the operations of the business. Um, so just take that uh, into account. Applicants must self-certify on the application that they meet the eligibility requirements. Uh, for example, an applicant has five owners who each own 20% of the applicant. Two owners are veterans. One owner is socially and economically disadvantaged individual. SBA will consider this applicant to meet the requirement of at least 51% of the applicant is owned by a priority group. Um, so you may be asking what does socially and economically disadvantaged mean? Uh, socially disadvantaged individuals are those who have been subjected to racial and ethnic prejudice or cultural bias because of their identity as a member of a group without regard to their individual qualities. Individuals who are members of the following groups are presumed to be socially disadvantaged. Black Americans, Hispanic Americans, Native Americans, including Alaska Natives and Native Hawaiians, Asian Pacific Americans and subcontinent Asian Americans. Economically disadvantaged individuals are those socially disadvantaged individuals who, whose ability to compete in the free enterprise system has been impaired due to diminished capital and, a credit, and credit opportunities as compared to others in the same business area who are not socially disadvantaged. So eligibility as a priority group applicant. Um, entity, re okay, so we really got to stress this one. Entity reorganization for purposes of qualification for the priority period will result in automatic disqualification of the award. So what does that mean? Uh, it means that if your entity was set up and the ownership was uh, a majority, I guess, uh, non-eligible priority applicant, um, Let's just say it was majority. Um, you you had uh, forty nine percent uh, female and fifty one percent male, uh, and that male did not fall within priority group. And then you tried to change that around, kind of in the last minute, and make the female you know fifty one percent. Then you're going to be automatically disqualified. So any changes you're trying to make to your organizational structure just in, in order to qualify for the program is gonna cause you to be disqualified. So just, just throw that out there um, because the SBA is looking, looking for that. Okay, so funding set-asides. There are some set-asides in the program. Um, just to, you know, the SBA has uh, trying to be fair to all different size businesses. Um, and they've done that by one, creating priority groups and two, uh, creating set-asides. So five billion is set aside for applicants with 2019 gross receipts of not more than $500,000. And an, an additional four billion is set aside for applicants with 2019 gross receipts from 500,000 to one and a half million dollars. And then lastly, an additional 500 million is set aside for applicants uh, very small businesses with gross receipts, 2019 gross receipts of not more than $50,000. So 
So this was this was to ensure that you know the money is kind of distributed amongst all the different size businesses as well. So SBA uh, does reserve the right to reallocate these funds at the discretion of the administrator. And that would be uh, the conclusion of uh, my section. And I'll hand it back over to Rebecca. All right. Thank you very much. Um, what you see on this slide right here, the restaurant revitalization portal demo, um, we are going to send this presentation out. But if we were to click on this link, um, I don't know that it will do it on this presentation, but it is a walkthrough of the actual um, application process once you get onto the SBA, the restaurant um, site to apply. It will walk you through each screen and help um, help identify the best way to answer some of these questions. So we will send this out to everyone on the call so that you can watch that um, if you have any questions applying. I will say I put in the link or I put a link into the chat box about um, the portal, the, reg the registration process and the portal to apply. The registration um, actually began this morning at nine o'clock. And you can begin registering and preparing your documents right now uh, to apply for this loan, or it's not a loan, this um, funding, this grant. And then on Monday, May 3rd, the portal will actually open for you to submit applications. Um, I will say that this funding is expected to go very quickly and it is very important to make sure that when you submit the um, submit your application, that everything is correct, that all of your um, corresponding documents and numbers and everything matches up. And that's one other um, benefit of our organization. We have consultants that are, that are able to sit down and walk you through the applications and, and help be a second set of eyes to make sure that your application is ready to submit. Because once you hit submit, if there is some type of discrepancy the SBA will send it back to you to fix. And by the time that that happens, you kind of lose that status in line. And um, there, it, you just, you may lose out because um, the funding will go quickly from what we're, what we're being told. So um, I would make sure that um, you go ahead and register so that you have that part done and you start preparing the necessary documents. Um, just so that you know, it'll take about 20 minutes to complete the application. Once you have everything prepared, um, we are definitely willing to, to help you with that again. Um, if anyone has any questions at this time, I'm going to go back and there are a couple of questions in the chat box that I will um, address. But um, if you have any more, just go ahead and, um, and put those in the chat box right now. We have um, some folks helping to monitor that chat. But one question that we did have was regarding the required documentation. Um, and the question was, the required documentation requires three months of bank statements. Which three months are needed? The most recent three months or three months from 2020? And from what we, um, what we have been told is that we believe that it is the final three months of the specified period. Um, applicants must provide the three most recent months of bank statements that are available to them within with their application documentation, um, and the bank statements must be for the bank from the for the applicant's business account into which the RRF funds will be deposited. Um, we have a we did have a question about the um, what explained the affiliate business, and I know that there are a few answers that were put into the chat box. But just for um, just for clarification on the video, the question was what on 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 the application on question seven, um, it refers to an applicant an affiliate business. So an affiliate business is a business in which the eligible applicant business has an ownership interest of not less than 50% or in which the eligible applicant business has the contractual authority to control the direction of other businesses based on arrangements or agreements 
in place as of March 13th of 2020. And then um, we have a question about who you can send your application to at the SBDC to review before Monday at noon. Um, and we will send our information out to you. And, um, and Ms. Frost, I, I see your name. We will make sure that we reach out directly to you after this webinar. We'll have a consultant on the call reach out to you so that we can get that um, conversation started. You can reach out to us to re um, receive consulting and one on no cost, one to one business consulting um, on our website at scsbdc.com. When you go to the website, there's a blue box at the top of the right, the right hand corner of the box, and it says to register here. Um, and when you register, it will put you into, con uh, it will connect you to a business consultant in a location closest to you. Um, and so that's how you can, you can typically register, but we see you on the call right now and we'll make sure that we reach out um, before the end of the day today. So, um, with that, I don't see any more questions in the chat. Um, I will say that this webinar has been recorded. And like I mentioned at the beginning of our presentation today, um, you will receive an email with this presentation in the PDF, which will include a link of, um, which will recruit, I'm sorry, which will include a link to the um, walkthrough of the application, the presentation, the recording, and we will have a small survey, um, a short survey for you. Um, if you don't mind completing that, that will help us provide future events like this. And if you have any questions, please uh, do not, please feel free to reach out. Do not hesitate to, for that. Um, we appreciate your time this afternoon and we will provide a follow-up email um, after this presentation has concluded. So with that, I hope that everyone has a wonderful Friday and um, if you need any help, we are here for you. Have a great day.